Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our, our keynote speaker for the day. Brian Calhoun got started in the music business when he was in college, started as a radio DJ, as so many in the industry do, then became a concert promoter, promoting uh, so many of the, the great acts in the earlier eras of, of hip-hop music, went on to really be involved in pretty much every aspect of the music industry that there is, uh, working for record labels as both A&R and business development, and then later going into the software business, developing tools to help independent artists and artist management companies promote their businesses. Um, currently, he is with Sound Exchange, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is the uh, performance rights organization for digital music transmissions, and they are responsible for distributing millions and millions of dollars that are being collected every year to not only the composers of songs that are transmitted over the internet, but also to the performers on, their, on those songs, which is quite different from what happens with the traditional PROs. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about making money, making music, and he's come all the way in from Washington, D.C., in transit to the West Coast. So, Brian, thank you so much for making the effort to be here today. And please give a warm New Orleans welcome to Brian Calhoun. All right, thanks so much. It's, uh, it's uh, really great to be here. So I'm going to start things off in an interesting way, I think. This is $20. I'd like to see who would like to get this. OK, a few hands. That's sort of a uh, passive approach to getting paid. Hey, here you go. All right, that's what I'm talking about. So, you know, what does it really take to make money in the music industry today? Uh, you know, aside from that type of initiative, it takes strategy. And uh, the, it takes a number of strategies. And uh, the strategies of today are a lot different than they were, say, 10 years ago. So, often when you hear stories about the music industry today and you're reading, it's usually about how the industry is in decline, how we, uh, we're a dinosaur, we're dying. Um, that, uh, you know, you'll see a story and it's about piracy, loss of sales, revenue being down, losses, that we're all doomed, but uh, here you all sit and you're all still making music. So, first let me set your mind at ease a little bit. Um, reports of the music industry's death have been highly exaggerated. Um, it's an industry that was supposed to have completely uh, uh, been obliterated a dozen times over the past century with the advent of new technologies from the gramophone to FM radio to MP3s and the internet itself. And we're still here. At the same time, you see messages about how easy it is. You can follow the DIY model, which is do it yourself, and that any artist, any indie label can make it and be successful. And it is true that many of the barriers to entry uh, no longer exist. Um, there are still some challenges. But those are starkly contrasting, um, starkly contrasting messages. On one page of a magazine, you've got the story about the business circling the drain. And on the other side, you've got uh, stories about how easy it is to make it. And that brings us to our topic, making money, making music. Harder than it looks, but simpler than it seems. You know, we've all heard the rhetoric, you know, you've got to work hard, and it's not what you know, it's who you know, um, and those types of things. But those aren't going to be the things that ultimately get you closer to achieving your goal, which is making a living in the music industry. Fortunately, you're here at Sync Up, and they're doing a great job of bringing you access to people uh, that can help you in that regard. There are a number of really good sources out there. You know, the internet, which I've already mentioned, there's, it's, it's tremendous that you have access to so much information now. 
On the screen, I have a list of uh, a few websites that I think are really great sources of information. It's up to you to go get it. I do want to caution you that you should be careful about where you get your, your news from because there are places that don't have your best interest in mind. They're really just interested in creating uh, controversial stories so that they can get page views so that they can sell advertising. Uh, now, is it going to be easy? No. There's a lot of competition. There are a lot of moving parts. But if you understand the fundamentals, it'll make things a lot easier. And, and that's what I want to talk about is uh, some of the fundamentals. So if you understand that all of the revenue that you're going to make are going to come from three basic sources. The first is the musical composition and that copyright. And that's money for the notes and the lyrics on a page. Uh, and that is money that goes to the publisher and the writer. You also have the sound recording and the sound recording copyright. And the money derived from it goes to paying the performer and the owner of the master recording, which is usually uh, a record label. And that is the fixation of the unique sound into some medium, whether it's uh, a CD or, or an MP3. You guys with me so far? OK, good. The other is your likeness. Uh, it's your, your, your image, your celebrity, which can be exploited in a, number, in a number of different ways. Broadly, it's your name, it's your band's name, it's your logo. It's essentially the value of your celebrity and your ability to draw a crowd um, and your credibility with your fans. So when you control all of these rights yourself, you have maximum flexibility to do more or less what you want to do. But you will have to wear a lot of hats. Giving up these rights to a label or a publisher uh, could offer you some great opportunities, like advances and access that you may otherwise not have. But it does come with some trade-offs, and you need to be aware of what they are before you sign a deal. If, for instance, the record label that you're signed to uh, is approached by a film company who wants to use your uh, recording in a film, but they can't agree to a price, or maybe they don't return the phone call, you're out of luck. So before you sign an agreement with anyone, make sure that you uh, understand what you're giving up. Uh, although doing it yourself does uh, give you the most control, it does require quite a bit of work. And quite frankly, you may not even have the opportunity to sign a deal with someone. Uh, it's definitely more and more difficult to do that. But if ultimately that is your end goal, to get signed with someone, that's OK. But I always recommend to people that you try to make money along the way. So if you are going to do it yourself, you're going to need some help. There are a number of people and technologies out there that you're going to need to employ to help you out. So I want to expound on this. So you have the three basic sources uh, from which you derive your revenue, uh, the things that you hope to be able to make, your, uh, make a living from. Next, you're going to need a way to connect with your fan base and market to them. So what does that mean you're going to do? Are you going to set up a lawn table in the front yard or go door to door and like, like, the, like the Girl Scouts? No, of course not. You're going to use the biggest, most powerful tool that you have at your disposal. That's the internet. So everyone tells you that you need to be on the web, that you need to have a website. But what does that really mean? Setting up your social media following, this is a really great start. But how do you put it all together and ultimately turn it into a source of revenue? So let's talk about the, uh, the three tenets of an online presence and some of the tools available to help you out. The great thing about uh, technology right now is that in the internet age, uh, the tools that the, the biggest stars in the world use are accessible to you. They may not be the exact same technology, although in many times they are. They're frequently uh, starter versions of things that you can use. So the three tasks are your ability to connect and communicate, and that's done through CRM, or your customer relationship management, uh, host and be heard, your content management system, uh, and your e-commerce. So, host and be heard. Your content management system. Here we're talking about the platform that's used to be able to host and where you're going to build your website and where it's going to come from. Uh, you may have heard people talking about having uh, a WordPress site or a Drupal site. Those are content management systems. You don't necessarily have to have a really expensive designer go out and build you some very expensive fancy page, but you do want to make sure that you do have something that's user-friendly and easy. Uh, you know, 
there, there are many tools out there. There's a few listed up here that are going to help you out. Essentially, your content management system is the place where you're going to host and store and display your content. And then you're going to want to integrate that with some other free tools to host and display your content, things like YouTube and Flickr for video and images. Also, uh, SoundCloud up there has become really popular late, lately to uh, host and uh, stream your recordings. Connect and communicate. This is your customer relationship management and a number of tools there. Uh, this is going to be connecting with your fans via email or text message or other means. Uh, you can use it to acquire new fans, enhance relationships that you already do have, and, and retain those relationships for a long time. So again, it might be email lists, text messages, or other things that you can use, such as uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you see a few other examples up there right now. You know, one of the things that would be stored, for instance, in your CRM application would be about who bought what from you where. So if you want to know who bought a t-shirt from you in Miami, your CRM application should be able to pull that information up for you. Buying and selling. You're going to have to buy some things in order to sell them, and sometimes it's going to be digital products. This is your, uh, uh, your e-commerce, your e-commerce solutions. You want to be able to sell t-shirts, tickets, CDs, and so forth, but you also don't want to limit yourself to that. Uh, you know, anything that you can make reasonably scarce is something that you can sell. So it could be like a, a, an experience with a fan, uh, maybe going out to dinner with, uh, uh, with one of your fans. You know, Elvis, uh, people used to sell cans of soda that Elvis used to use. So, uh, you know, things with your saliva on it probably aren't that valuable, but you know, you, you get the idea. <laughs> on a side note, I want to mention something about giving away your music and giving things away. Um, that's something that everybody has to make a, a decision on individually, and it can work to your advantage. Um, but I like to recommend to people that if you're going to give something away, get something in, in return for it. So that could be getting an email address so that you can communicate with them at another time, or tweet for a track. So you allow somebody to download it if they tweet about it. Uh, it just a, a, simple, a quick story to, to talk about this. Uh, some friends of mine uh, manage uh, this artist named Drake, and he's a very big super hip hop artist. But years ago, uh, you know, I guess about a year and a half ago, maybe even two years ago at this point, he was, they were giving away his recordings on his website for free. And he had gotten to the point where he was really, really popular, and you couldn't buy his recordings anywhere, but they were giving it away. And I said, you know, you guys, you have got to start selling something, just give people the option. And they're like, yeah, but we're giving it away on the site to build awareness. I was like, yeah, that's great, but give people the option. Well, we put the first song up, and in 10 days, sold 300,000 downloads of the single. Now, that's the sort of an extreme example, but the song was still available for free on his website. But we just gave people the option to buy, and many of them did. I know this seems like a lot. But if you try to keep it in terms of these three simple things, it should make it a little bit easier. Now, there are a number of tools that combine two or more of these, uh, uh, two or more of these functions into one platform. And up here, you can see a few of them. Some of them have gotten really popular over the years, uh, over recent years. In addition to that, you're going to want to look at your analytics. So this is a way for you to look and see how things that you've been doing pay off. How are your efforts paying off? Uh, there's some free tools. Uh, Google has some stuff. Uh, Next Big Sound has some free things. And you want to look at things like, what are the open rates of your emails? Uh, how many times did people visit your website from another uh, site? Uh, what is the source? So that you can focus your efforts and see what's ultimately working uh, and ultimately working for you. I've also got some basic guidelines uh, that I've found to be uh, successful for artists, whether they're big or small, and you know, to properly launch your site and your social media pages to, to sort of get you off to the races. The first is respect. You need to respect your fans. Don't spam them. If they want to opt out of your list, let them. Don't sell your list to anyone. 
It's very important that you do that. You also need to respect the partner services that you work with. So the technology companies that I just mentioned and had up on the screen, they're working hard to bring you new technologies and platforms that will help you achieve your goal, so respect them. They need to make a living too. But you should also make sure that they respect you and your work and that they are not taking advantage of you. Authenticity. The communications that come need to be authentic. It really needs to be the artist. And if it's not the artist, be clear about who it is. You know, it, it's one thing to, to lend your likeness or image, but it's another thing to deceive your fans. You definitely don't want to do that. Consistency. If it's going to be one tweet a day, tweet once a day. If you're going to make one blog post a month, do it once a month. What you don't want to do is do 12 tweets in an hour, and then your fans don't hear from you for a month. One of the things that's sort of changed in the industry is the concept of cycles. There used to be a, a concentrated amount of, of messaging from an artist around an album release or touring and around those cycles. But in today's environment, that's becoming less and less relevant. Exclusivity. When you have big news, break it on the sites that you control. You'll get your message out the way you want it, and you'll become the go-to source for information about you and your band. Syndication. Get your message out in the places where your fans are. So go to Facebook, go to Twitter, MySpace, wherever they're hanging out. Then you can use that to, 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 uh, to drive them back to, the, to your website and places where you can ultimately make some money. So, yes, there are a lot of exciting new ways to make money, but the traditional revenue streams are going to be where you're still going to make the bulk of it. Sales, merchandise, appearances, touring. First start by improving margins there. You want to make sure that if you have the ability to increase your or improve your efficiency, you make more money on the sale of each t-shirt. It's easier to upsell an existing fan than it is to acquire a new one. So sell someone an album instead of just a single or a concert ticket instead of just a t-shirt. It's going to take a lot of small earnings from a lot of different places in order to add up to be uh, something that you can use to make a sustainable living. Uh, Future Music Coalition has a, a really cool list of 29 separate and distinct revenue streams that they've posted on their site, and I encourage you to check it out. We have a... Uh, Hopefully it's being passed out. You may already have it. Do you all have in your hands the new artist checklist? You got it? Okay, fantastic. This is something I'm really proud of. It's got a lot of things. I'm not going to go through all of it in detail. You have it. But the most important uh, concept to take away from it is don't leave money on the table. And, you know, it might sound obvious, but it's really not. You've got to keep up and keep track of a whole lot of things. Sound Exchange, the organization that I work with, literally has tens of millions of dollars for tens of thousands of artists and labels sitting in the bank that we can't pay for the mere fact that the artists and labels haven't registered. They haven't told us where to send the money. I would love to send the money to everyone, but they've got to tell us where to send it. Um, you've got to do this. You've got to, you've got to take care to understand all these things in order to make sure that you're getting your share. Um, so I want to focus a little bit on performance royalties for a minute. And that's the revenue that you generate when the compositions or the recordings that you've created are played in public. <clears throat> uh, as I said before, there are two copyrights in every sound recording. The first is the musical composition, and that goes to pay the writer and the publisher. Those performances are, uh, and the royalties associated with, are collected and distributed through ASCAP, BMI, and CSEC. But there's also the sound recording, and that's where sound exchange comes in. Specifically, sound exchange collects on non-interactive digital performances. So these are from services like satellite radio, internet radio, cable radio. So I say satellite, we're talking about um, XM Sirius, Internet, Pandora, Last FM, Slacker, cable radio, talking about um, Dishnet, 
Music Choice. Those are the high number cable channels that you see, uh, whether whoever your service provider is. So usually like the 400 number channels or so. We do not collect for digital downloads, uh, interactive streams where the user has the ability to click and play the individual recording that they want to hear at the time, uh, or audiovisual works like YouTube. Under the law that governs sound exchange, the royalties are split three ways. 50% goes to the owner of the sound recording, which is usually the record label. If the artist owns his own masters, he is the label. He is the sound recording copyright owner and is entitled to that revenue stream. 45% goes straight to the performer, the artist, whoever performs the recording. And 5% goes to a fund, which goes to pay background singers and session players. Indie artists who own and control their own masters get 95% of the royalties. It's very important that when you register with Sound Exchange, if you do own your own masters, that you register as both an artist and a copyright owner. 10 years ago, these revenues probably weren't very significant to most people. We distributed about a million dollars a year for, uh, for artists and labels and spread out across the entire industry. It's kind of small money. Last year, however, Sound Exchange distributed a quarter of a billion dollars. That's a B. That's a B. Again, we have, unfortunately, tens of millions of dollars for tens of thousands of artists that we can't pay simply because they haven't registered. All you have to do is register once, it's free, and then you'll collect your royalties every quarter that you have something due. So what does that mean on an individual basis? Individual uh, artists have seen their revenues grow over the past few years from $700 to $2,800 a year. This is average. Labels from $5,000 to $14,000. And you'll notice, and also sound recording copyright owners uh, who are also artists have seen their revenues go up. So everybody's money's been going up. So the other thing I really need to highlight here, I want to highlight is about metadata. Does everybody have the metadata document? Yes? Come on. There we go. All right. Thank you. All right. Metadata. So for all of the small payments from all these different revenue sources to work, um, you've got to uh, be aggressive about making sure that those payments ultimately get back to you. So think of metadata, which is the information that's encoded in your, your tracks, like luggage tags on suitcases full of money. The best way and the best chance for that money to get to you is to have your, your, your luggage tag with the appropriate information on it. And uh, for everybody who's like, meta what? what is it? I understand, it's, but it's, it's something that we've been very aggressive about going and talking to people about uh, because it is so important. So we've been really doing a lot to educate people because if you don't have the appropriate information in, in your recording and you send it out to a service, when they report what they've played to us, we might end up getting something that says, various artists, promo only, track number five. If that's the case, we can't connect your royalties with you. So make sure that you include all of the appropriate information in the metadata before you distribute it to anyone. Specifically, make sure that every time you're including the artist name, the copyright owner name, the track title, and the album title. Does everybody get their luggage tag? Okay, make sure you get your luggage tag. We got them out there. Like we, it's, it's, it's a handy reminder. Make it easy, sound exchange, we make it easy to collect your royalties, and we make it easy to collect your luggage. So, with that being said, no one cares as much about your future as you do, so it's your responsibility to make sure that you're, uh, you're, you're working in the industry and learning and educating yourself and being aggressive about collecting all the royalties and so forth and income streams that are due to you. There are no shortcuts, but the information is out there and available to you. Um, you can uh, get the information that I've talked about by uh, following Sound Exchange at Sound Exchange on Twitter. And if you tweet, get played, get paid, we'll send you a copy of the 
uh, we'll DM you and let you know how we can get you the, a copy of the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation I just shared with you. You can follow me at, at Brian Calhoun, and you can also connect with us on Facebook uh, at Sound Exchange. So, with that being said, who wants this $20? <laughs> All right, there you go. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you guys. If you have any questions, I'll be outside. Thank you.